Amen. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. Verse 10. Did you have fun last night? Well, did anyone not sleep last night? You're ignorant. I'm trying, I'm trying to think, man, I don't think I'd want to step on night nowadays, but I'm almost 40. But when I was your age, I stayed up all night and did what you do. Today we are we are we are living in the greatest hour of the church. How many know that? How many glad to be a part of the apostolic church? Amen. Amen. Nehemiah 1 verse 10 says, Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name, and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He said, Lord, there has to be a revival. There has to be a change in Jerusalem. And I'm asking you, God, to give me favor with the king. Somebody say, favor with the king. He ends the prayer by saying, For I was the king's cupbearer. Everybody say the king's cupbearer. Cup well, I've got a Tim Hortons cup here. Amen. I just feel the Lord moving all over me right now as I got this. Are there any Tim Hortons coffee drinkers in the building? Two of you. Are, are there, is there anyone here that likes coffee? Oh, let there be a witness from somebody right now. Any, any, any coffee drinkers in here? All right, rest of you not going to make it. I preached about where you're going last night if you don't drink coffee. Amen. <laughs> the cupbearer. Everybody say, the king's cupbearer. Cup Amen. I want you to look at two or three people and say, I want to be the king's cupbearer. Cup Amen. How many want to make a difference in your life? I may want to make a difference in your lifetime. I want you to lift your hands and I want you to ask God. I want you to forget about the person beside you. And I want you to ask God to let you fulfill your purpose in his kingdom. Would you do that? Lift your hands all over the room. I want you to ask the Lord right now. God, I pray that right now that you would speak to us today. You would anoint me, Lord, to teach you would anoint our ears to hear. I pray you would give me the unction to speak, oh God, to these amazing youth, God, here in Canada. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone says, Amen. amen. You may be seated. It was one of those services where the Spirit of God was lingering, lingering in the room. The altar call was given. Those that were hungry had responded and were seeking God in the altar of the church where I pastor. And I, I noticed that in that atmosphere that uh, I look back to a lady that had been in church. I've been in Zanesville for 14 years uh, now as of next month. Been pastoring there for 10, 10 years. Went there as a youth pastor. But I've known this lady. She's been in church all of her life. She's about 50 years old. And I uh, saw her back at the seat, and I just felt compelled by the Holy Ghost to go talk to her. And people were in the altar praying. And I walked back, and very few people were back in the seats. Most were in the altar. Went back, and I sat on the seat in front of her, and I turned around, and I said, The Lord's dealing with you. And I noticed that you're crying. And, and I said, what, What's going on? What, what's wrong? And she said, Oh, Pastor, she said, You know, I came to the Lord as a little girl. 
she said, I'd get on the church van and I'd come to church. And she said, I, I, uh, been in this all my life. She said, I'm just stirred. She said, because in all of my life, I've never led one person to the Lord. And she said, I'm 50 years old. And she said, my greatest fear at this stage of my life is that just before I die, I'm going to look over my shoulder and realize that I've never made a difference in anybody. Never made a difference in anybody. We as apostolics have the greatest gift of all. It's truth. It will propel us beyond this lifetime into eternity. We sing songs like, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We have verses that we believe that this, 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 corruptible, shall, this, this corruptible shall put on incorruptible and this mortal shall put on immortality. We shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We have this hope. Can you say amen? It goes on, it says, Death, where is thy sting? And grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death is, is sin. And I've preached a lot of funerals in the last year. I've preached from young and old. And I've watched funerals that I've preached that people knew that person wasn't right with God and the grieve because they know this is it for them. And, but I've preached others that had died in the faith and we knew there's going to be a reunion. There's going to be a reuniting. There's going to be a, there's going to be a gathering in the sky. And how many know one of these days that trumpet's going to sound and we're going to go to heaven. Can you say amen? Yeah. Clap your hands and thank God that we have this hope. We have this hope. And so we, we have this privilege of knowing that that if we die tonight or die tomorrow, that we have a hope in God, that we have a home beyond the blue. It's called, it's called heaven. And we know how to get there. Someone told us about this gospel of Jesus Christ, and it was very powerful. But here's our issue as apostolic sometimes. We become content to be saved, but to never make a difference. God didn't call us to make a living. He called us to make a difference. And if we're not careful, we'll get caught up in culture and want to be like everybody else and just, the, just, just come to church and pay our tithes, go to church and make it a religion instead of truly get the heart of God and what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to just go to church three times a week or twice a week, however your church structure is set up. There are people all around you that are lost and need what you have. There really are. There's, there's teenagers that sit in your schools. How many of you go, in a, or go to a public school? Would you raise your hand? How many of you are in Christian schools? Would you raise your hand? How many, are, there, are there any homeschoolers here? Yeah. And uh, how many are in college? Come on, raise your hand high. How many are working a job? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. How many have family that's not right with God? Raise your hand. All around you every single day, all around you every single day, there are people that are going the wrong direction away from the Lord. In the scripture, the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 3, and I'll just allude to it, but, but the scripture tells us that they daily went to the temple for the hour of prayer. Don't raise your hand, but when's the last time you prayed for an hour outside of church service? When's the last time you prayed an hour. When's the last time you got on your face and you didn't know whether you've been praying for 30 minutes or, or, or an hour and a half because you got into this element with God that time didn't matter. It was the last time you broke through outside of a church service and that there was such a powerful move of God. It was just you and the Lord and you got up from the altar stirred in your bedroom. or Maybe it was outside of a church service. Maybe you were at the church praying on an off service. When's the last time you've done that? I'm convinced that the reason that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved because the church was praying daily. And I'm also convinced the reason we only have conversion sometimes on the weekends because that's the only time we pray. I'm sounding condemning, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to stir us to be truly apostolic. There's a whole lot more to this than baptism in Jesus' name and speaking in tongues every now and then. God has called us to be a difference maker in his kingdom. 
You see, God adds to the church daily such as should be saved. And if I would ask you where you come from or where your family come from, somewhere you will find somebody in your heritage that somebody invited them to church. Somebody taught them a Bible study. At some point, someone in your world was first generation apostolic because someone gave them an opportunity and shared with them how to be saved and what they need to do to be saved. Isn't that right? You're not just here by accident, but God sent someone to your family or to you that said, hey, you've got to come to church on Sunday night. Or they testified to you about the power, the amazing power of God. And there was something that stirred within you or your family that said, I want that. There's something missing. How many are glad that somebody reached out to you or your family? Amen. You wouldn't be here if that had not happened. God put Ananias in in Saul's life who in turn became the apostle Paul and he was grateful because God sent a man to him. And I want you to know that every single person in this room, God wants to send you to somebody so they won't go to hell but they'll have an opportunity to be in heaven. Somebody say amen. I was probably 18 years old. I was in college, went to a secular school was in engineering school, and I was on my way to college one morning. I was so stirred. I, 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 I believed that God wanted to use me. I was wanting to be a soul winner, and, and uh, how many know there's an awkwardness to invite somebody to church? Anybody ever wanted to but didn't? How many's ever felt compelled to invite your waiter, waitress, maybe uh, somebody next door neighbor or someone? How many's ever felt you're supposed to go ask somebody to come to church or witness to him and you felt really strong about it and your heart started beating fast can anybody relate with that you walked out of me like this I'm going to win somebody to the Lord and boy then you see the opportunity and it's like what if they say no how many's ever thought that huh how many's ever talked yourself out of that come on be honest with me come on I'm apostolic so I can talk this way I know what I, I know what I'm talking about And uh, many times I felt compelled to ask someone or to witness to someone. And I remember remember the first person I went to the Lord, I was 16 years old. And and, uh, man, they they became a preacher, became mightily used to the Lord. And that was a stir. I wanted to win somebody else. But I remember that going down the road at age 18, I... uh, uh, I was on the way to college and there was this guy. You have to realize in West Virginia, there's a mountain, tall mountain here. There's a road, there's a railroad track. There's a row of houses, and then there's a river where, where I went to school, where I lived, just along the river, just these little towns along the river. And I looked over my way to college, and there was a guy washing his, his Jeep. I can still remember it. His name was Tobias. I didn't know him well. He would have known me. I would have known him, but not well, just at a distance going to school together. And I remember driving down the road, and something pulled me in my spirit toward this guy. And I felt like God spoke to me and said, Go tell him that I love him and I want to change his life. You know what happened to me at that moment? You know what I'm talking about? My heart started beating. and Man, I was so stirred. The further, the further I got away from him, the stronger the pull became. I did a U-turn. Drove back, back up the road and now he's on my right. And I'm like, oh, Aaron, you're just excited. You want to win everybody. That's just passion speaking. Yeah, that's, that's, you just want to. Yes, that's you. That's not God. Passed him up again and turned around and come back and have to make a decision now. And I'll come back to the little turn where it would pull over the tracks and go to his house. I can see him washing his Jeep. You know what happened? And I talked myself out of it. And I said, I, I'm just going to go go on to school and God understands. I've got college and got that, that, that. And uh, I passed him up and two days later he died in a boating accident. Went into eternity without anyone ever telling him about this truth. I've repented many times over that moment because what if I'd have just... Tobias, I know it's awkward, you know, I'm Aaron, but I just felt like to tell you that God cares about you. He loved you enough to die on the cross, and he wants to change your life. Who knows, he might be preaching this meeting today. It convicted me so. He, he never had a parent that lived this life. 
it absolutely, Brother Matt, changed me. Because I thought that wasn't Aaron that was wanting to witness. That was God compelling me to stir him. And I just want you to know right now that there is something happening among us. That God wants us to be a difference maker and not just a church goer. That you've got to override your flesh and override your timidness and override your, override your shyness and say, God, even Jesus, he was despised and rejected. And if you've never been rejected, you've probably never tried. But there's got to get something in you that says, God, I don't want anybody to get, go to hell on my account. I don't want anybody to not have the truth because I wouldn't be obedient But God. I don't want to be like that lady that said, Lord, in, in these 50 years, I've never made a difference in anybody's life. And I feel like there's some people here before you you leave today that you're going to say you know what I'm making a covenant with God if they mock me they mock me if they reject me they reject me but I'm not going to let anybody be lost without this gospel for if the gospel be hid it's hid to them that are lost but I'm going to make sure somebody knows about the gospel come on anybody feel what I'm talking about right now come on go ahead I want you to respond I want you to be tender I want you to respond and when you begin to look at the book of Nehemiah, something had taken place. It was during the Babylonian captivity in, in uh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem was a beautiful place. It was a wonder of the world. It was an amazing, amazing place to go with all of its gold trimmings and its detailed architecture. It was absolutely a, a phenomenon. Some believe it would have been one of the wonders of the world. Even one lady traveled one lady traveled a thousand miles without a plane, a train, or an automobile to come and see that, the Queen of Sheba. It was beautiful. It was stunning. And all of a sudden, because of Israel's disobedience and their sin and their transgression, God had separated them from there. And the enemy had come in and tore down the gates and burnt the houses and destruction. It became the ruins. It became just an, a, a terrible place. Those people that lived there were broken and in and, and poverty and... and uh, when Nehemiah heard what was going on in Jerusalem and he had seen the burnt gates and the smell of, 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 of the, the fire and, and, and all of its brokenness and its ashes, he got so stirred. And he said, oh God, it's not right. Their life, it shouldn't be that way. It, 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 they, they, they shouldn't be scattered and in bondage. It, oh, Jerusalem, it shouldn't be that way. And he got so stirred in his spirit that he couldn't eat for days. He fasted, the Bible says. And he began to repent and say, oh, God, forgive me. and Forgive my father's house. But, Lord, let there be a changing inside of Jerusalem. And he makes this statement. He said, Lord, you did say in your law that if we would transgress your law, that you would scatter them, scatter them. Uh, 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 all over. He said, but you also said that if we would, they would repent and they would turn to you was the word he used. He said, if they were scattered to the uttermost parts of heaven, he said, you would begin to gather to them, to you again. You know what he was saying? It doesn't matter how far they've gone. When they begin to turn to the Lord, the Lord's going to gather them back. How many know you can't get too far that God can't begin to pull you back in? Amen. That's an exaggerated term. When it said you've been scattered to the uttermost part of heaven, that's an exaggerated term. Where is that? That means a long, long ways away. But if they turn, he said, I'm going to begin to gather you again. I want you to understand there is a gathering that's going on right now, this end time revival. There's a gathering of backslider. There's a gathering of sinners. And the Lord's using his people to see the gathering. And God wants to use every single one of you to be a part of that arm of gathering them in. Come on, how many want to see the church field? How many want to see your youth group field? How many want to see your family members in the church? How many want to see backsliders back into the kingdom? Somebody shout, there is a gathering. He said they would turn. and he, he said you would bring them back again. And he's praying, he's fasting, he's burdened. Where did that burden come from? It came from the Lord. His prayer wasn't just something one day he just thought of. No, his prayer had come from God. The burden for those people, God was using him to fulfill a prophecy to restore Jerusalem. And he began to pray this. He said, now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. He said, Lord, I need favor. Everybody say favor. 
You know what favor is? Favor is when you go to preach for someone and they receive the word that you're saying. Favor is when, like Brother Ricardo Hatfield, when he's singing, the people respond to that. Not just gift or talent, but the Lord has anointed you and the people respond and it caused them to respond to what you're saying. Favor is when you walk up to a stranger and say, my name's Aaron, and something stirs within them. And the words that leave your mouth aren't just words, but they're, a, they're laced with the anointing of God. And when it hits their ears, something stirs and says, I need to listen to this guy. It's the favor of the Lord. Mouth of the Holy Ghost right now. I'm not talking about just logical soul winning. I'm talking about spirit led soul winning. I'm talking about God leading you to them. God leading you to them. I'll give you an example of this. I was 19. I was preaching a, a, a youth rally and I had a guy that had just come to the Lord who went with me to preach this youth rally. And uh, his name was Kenny. And our waitress at our restaurant she come up holding her little pan like this. She had an attitude. She came up. And, How can I help you? Told her what I wanted. She had a little smirk on her face, attitude, you know. She walked away, and I told Kenny, I said, well, she sure is hateful. You know. And she was. I didn't tell her. I was, but she was. And uh, he's new in the church. And he said, let's invite her to church. Let's, let's get her to come to church. And I got condemned. Been in this all my life and didn't even think of it. <laughs> I didn't even think of it. And he said, let's, let's invite her to the house of God. You know, so I have, to, I, have, I have to put on my experience, you know. That's right. Amen. We need to invite her to the church. Act like I, I was already in the vein, you know. And uh, I said, uh, she came back to the table. I got to show him how it's done. You know what I mean? I'm a preacher, raised in this, fourth generation. My dad's a pastor. He's new, and he's preaching to me at the same. He doesn't even know it, but he's preaching to me. And uh, she comes to the table. She's holding the pan. And uh, I said, I'd like to, like to invite you to church. Oh, yeah? I said, yeah. Well, well uh, what kind of church is it? <laughs> it's an apostolic church. She said, a papa what? <laughs> yeah. So somebody called one time and said, may I speak to Calvary Apopolistic at the church? I answered the church phone one time. They, don't have, they didn't know what it was. They, you know, they couldn't pronounce it. And uh, I said, an apostolic church. What kind of church is that, she said, with an attitude. I said, well, you know, I was trying to do good. I was trying my best. You know, I said, well, we don't, we don't change the word to fit our life. We just let God change our lives to fit the word. We believe God can make a change. As a matter of fact, I was born a cripple, and I started witnessing to her. See, that's how you win people, is you tell them of the power of God, and they have an element of faith anyhow. Everybody, there's no such thing as a true atheist. Because to every man is dealt a measure of faith. To every man. That's why they like superheroes. Do you hear me? Superman and Spider-Man and Batman, they love that kind of stuff, even from a child, because they love to think there's something beyond them, and they can do something beyond them. I'm going to tell you a superhero, and his name is Jesus, and he's not fake or a phony. How many know he's real? Praise God. Amen. And I, I looked, I, I, I told her about my feet. I said I was born crippled, and my legs and my feet were twisted, and the doctor had ordered me braces, straightened out my feet. And I said, I said to her, I said, uh, and my mom took me to church, and when they prayed to me in the name of the Lord, and, and they said the name of Jesus, those crooked feet just straightened right up. Well, I was so excited about telling her. I never had to wear one brace. God healed me before I ever put the brace on. And she looked at me. Well, I was waiting on a Holy Ghost response from her. And she said, I don't believe that. <laughs> oh, well, let me tell you another one about this person healed of cancer. This person smoked cigarettes for 40 years and threw it down. And she just said, I don't believe it. I don't believe that. Well, I was so humbled. I felt, I felt you know, well, I'm not doing a very good job. All of a sudden, Kenny, who was with me, he said, I was an alcoholic. My life was a mess. My family was split. But I went to church one night and something got a hold of me. God not only forgave me, he delivered me and gave me joy. But he began to witness from a sincerity. I looked up, she started crying. I'm like, how'd you do that? <laughs> she starts crying. And uh, I got her number and 
And I said, I'd like to, I'd like to teach you a, a Bible study. And we got her number, and I called her and uh, set up a Bible study with this waitress 45 minutes from where our church was. And, and, uh, and anyhow, on the phone, she said, I don't understand it. Why was it that when you left and you and Kenny left, that I stood there and held that pan in the back, sitting there in the back. She said, I, I stood there and cried for 30 minutes after you left. And this is what she told me. She said, what you, don't, you guys don't know is I have been praying every night. She said that God would change my life. She said, I was going to people and said, I, there's, there's going to be a change in me. I don't know how to get the change in me. She said, I was going to all my friends and no one knew. She said, I, so I started praying, God, would you send me somebody that would show me how to get my life changed? You think it's an accident we sit down in her section and she came to take our order? Oh, no, I taught her Bible study. I'm glad to tell you that she came to the church. She didn't understand why so-and-so was shouting. Matter of fact, she looked and she said, what in the world are they doing? I said, I have no idea. But God must have done something for her, you know, and she's responding. I wasn't, I wasn't denying that the lady shouldn't be worshiping. I just couldn't name the dance that she was doing, you know what I'm saying? But she was worshiping, and I said, she must be feeling God. She's thankful what the Lord's done. Before it was over, she came out of the water, and the Holy Ghost was all over. And when I took her back home, she said, I have never felt this good in my life. I feel like I could run home. I come to preach to you that soul winning is not just about you. It's about God leading you to them. Can you say amen? Somebody say amen. They're sitting beside you in the school. They are working with you at your work. They are, they are, they are in your college near you, but you don't know it because you haven't been near the king. You haven't been burdened by the Lord. And when he stirs you, it's going to be because you've been on your knees with him. They, they didn't just go preach. They didn't just go to the city. While Simon Peter was praying, the Lord dealt with him and said, when you hear these Gentiles come to your door, let them in and go to their house. I'm talking about spiritual alignment. And our problem, the reason we don't win souls is because we just go to church. We go to church and we live from moment to moment. We've got used to the presence of God at church, but we don't even know what that is at home. We don't know what that's like to feel that at our school. We don't know what it's like to walk into the church or you walk into work with tears running down our eyes because we've been burdened and we feel like that day something is going to happen. What if we would get along with the Lord and the Lord would move upon our spirit and you know, God, you're going to lead me to someday, somebody today. For the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I don't believe in coincidences and accidents with soul winning. Nehemiah is praying this prayer. He's burdened. He's fasting because he wants there to be a difference made. He wants something to change. He doesn't want these people to be lost. I don't know what to do right now, but just to tell you, there's got to get somebody concerned about the lost. Somebody's got to be concerned about those people near you that don't know who he is. Somebody's got to get concerned about your community and realize they're going to be lost if somebody doesn't reach them. And it's not going to happen on a Sunday. It's not going to happen on a weekend. It's going to happen because you came in contact with them. Somewhere during the weekend, they felt something from you. They couldn't get from the party. They couldn't get from alcohol. They couldn't get from drugs. They couldn't get from a game. They ain't going to get something because they felt something when they came near you. Somebody shout, my cup. Run it over. We got to learn to be spirit led. I'm trying to move on here. Don't be that lady that said, I've never made a difference. How do you make a difference? You got to get along with the king. When he prayed this prayer, he told the Lord, he said, I'm asking you for favor with the king. He said, I'm asking you to let him, let him see the cause in my life and let him give me favor to do what I need to do. Everybody say he had a burden and he asked for favor. Kim came to the Lord because there was the favor of the Lord. She felt something in Shoney's in that restaurant. She didn't feel anywhere else. How many want people to feel God when you're talking to them? I'm not talking about just explanation and, and you got to dot every I and cross every T. I'm talking about when you reach up 
and you shake their hand, something stirs within them. I asked God, I said, I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost that when I shake somebody's hand, something turns inside their spirit. I won a man to the Lord by shaking his hand one time. I did. I'm not boasting. I'm not bragging. But I prayed. I said, God, if you're in me, then they should feel it. Come on, I believe you could change an atmosphere of a room when you walk in because the aroma of the anointing. And it's not because how, you're, how, how well you look and, and how, how your hair is fixed. And I say that because I can't fix mine anymore. It's the reason is because you've been alone with the Savior and you smell in the aroma of the anointing of the King. And when you walk in, they say there's something different about those people. There's something different about that person. Come on. They are the creation. He is the creator. He lives in you. There's something in them that's going to recognize him that is in you. I feel like preaching for a few moments here that you're not just a church goer waiting on Jesus to come. No, we are a world changing body of Christ. He said, Lord, give me favor with the king. And by the way, Lord, by the way, I was the king's cupbearer. Just, just, just saying, the king I'm going to go talk to, I was his cupbearer. Brother Matt, would you, would you come and help me? Don't, you know, take care of this for me. There was no coffee in that because I didn't want to spill it. It was hard for me to, t- to dump that little bit out because I really like Tim Wharton's coffee. I'm going to tell you right now. The cupbearer, what did the cupbearer do? I love you. I love your family. His dad, dad and his family are powerful ministers of the gospel. Aren't we thankful for families like this? Amen. Down in Indiana with a powerful church. Praise God. Let's thank God for his family, the Nichols family. Amen. The cupbearer, you know what the cupbearer would do? He would stand near the king. It was an honor. And honor, one of the highest positions in the kingdom was to be the cupbearer. It really was. There were so many neat things. He was always near the king. And when that day, when someone would try to kill the king, you know what they'd do? Anybody know? They'd try to poison the drink. And so the cupbearer had the privilege of drinking it first. He would pour it on his skin and then he would sip from the cup and he would make sure that the cup wasn't full of poison so the king could live forever. So every meal, the cup bearer risked his life to save the king. Every meal. How would you like to have that job? Well, I'm not getting sick, I'm not dying, so here you go, king. That's a sacrifice. But when he was talking to God, he said, I just want to remind you that I was the king's cupbearer. And I'm asking for favor from this king so I can go and restore my people back to you. And what he was saying was this. I had given my life to that king three times a day. Every meal for years. I've given my life to him, risked my life for him. When I walk in there, I believe that he's going to have some type of favor to give me to go permission to go do what I need to do. This is not about you. This is about him. This is not about your agenda. This is not about what you think. This is about what God wants to do in your life. And some of you aren't walking in, in his will because you've got your own focus. You've got your family traditions you're holding on to. But God's trying to call somebody out today. I feel it in the Holy Ghost to go make a difference in your world. Somebody shout amen. amen. Praise God. How many want to win a soul to the Lord in the next few months? Amen. Come on, if you do, I want you to respond. Stay with me. Inside, would you? And the cupbearer prays and says, I'm going to go see the king. And when he goes in to see the king, he said, I took up of the wine. He goes to visit the king. He takes of the drink and he does what he does. He sips it, he tests it, and then he hands the cup of wine to the king. And he says, and the king says, wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad? Can I just preach for a few more minutes? Come on, I've been teaching, but can I preach for a few minutes? 
I feel something about to break in this room. I, I feel like a wall is about to shatter. I feel like the barrier is about to be broken. I feel like the intimidation is about to go. I feel like there's somebody about to have a breakthrough in your ministry and your calling. Oh, somebody say amen. He walks in, and this is what he said, Brother Matt. He said, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And he said, I was so afraid because I had never entered into the presence of the king ever before sad in his presence. You know what that meant? For all the years that he served the king, he was able to put off his feelings and what he was going through to serve him, to serve the king. Why is it sometimes we come to the house of God and we don't worship because... Something didn't go our way. Why is it we come in and we can't praise God because of something that was in our life? Can I tell you, when you come into the king's house, it's not about you or what you're going through. It's all about the king. Come on, it's not about what you had to put up with, who rejected you, what kind of sickness you've dealt with, what kind of drama you had. When you come into the house, it's all about the king. It's not about you. It's not about what you want. It's about what the king wants. Oh, I wish somebody would jump to your feet and clap your hands and shout, it's about the king. It's about the king. It's about the king. That's why on Saturday night you can't stay up till 5 a.m. playing video games and expect to get into the house of God and it be all about the king. You can't sleep through the sermon and expect to be about the king. You can't come in here weary with your mind spinning and expect it all to be about the king. There's got to get some discipline in you and say, you know what? I'm going to bed tonight because I've got to go before the king tomorrow. Pastor's going to be preaching and it's all about the king. If you want to make a difference, you've got to have some self-denial. You've got to have some discipline. You've got to be able to say no to some things so you can say yes to the king. You've got to say no to your flesh so you can say yes to the king. Well, I don't feel like praising. Well, it really isn't about how you feel. It's about what you know. And he is the king. You gotta shake off the world. You gotta shake off what you think and say, I'm gonna make a joyful noise. I'm gonna worship anyhow. Well, I don't feel like amen to the preacher. It's not about you, it's about the king. I don't feel like going to the altar. It's not about you, it's about the king. What does the king want me to do? He wants me to be faithful. He wants me to be loyal. He wants me to be prayerful. He wants me to be worshipful. And if it doesn't matter how I feel, it doesn't matter the drama I've dealt with, I'm going to worship anyhow. I'm going to pray anyhow. I'm going to get up anyhow. Somebody shout, it's about the king. Here's our problem as apostolics. We are so spirit-led. We are spirit-led to do everything. That we wait for the Holy Ghost to fall before we worship. We got to feel the Holy Ghost goosebumps. And they got to have like four generations of babies. Before we respond. Because we base what we do on how we feel. But if you're ever going to be used of God, you got to do what you do because of what you know. And I know he's on the throne when my world seems upside down. I know he's worthy when I don't feel like praising him. I know. Here's my point. You cannot have favor of God, favor of the king without discipline. You can't do it. Why is it? We have to be spirit led. Somebody told my dad one time, they said, I'll be at church on Sunday if it's the will of God. <laughs> well, it's the will of God. Amen. We laugh at that, but the truth of the matter is, I'm going to get up in the morning to pray if the Holy Ghost wakes me up. <laughs> and you're late for, you, you, you're, you're late? You don't pray? Watch this. Here's what we do sometimes. 
Ha, 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 I feel this in the Holy Ghost. We pray at 11 o'clock at night. Give us this day our daily bread. You got an hour left. You know, I'm going to tell you the truth. And here's my concern. We delay the will of God because we're not disciplined to the king. He said, not one time did I go before the king with a sad countenance because I was able to put off what I was going through to make sure he got done in his kingdom what he needs to get done. And if we're ever going to reach our world, it's because we prayed before we started our day. We had a devotion with the king before we started our day. Walk with me. You can remain standing. I'm almost finished. Is everybody okay? How many want to win a soul to the Lord? You know what's so cool about being the king's cup bearer? You got to hear everything going on in the kingdom. You knew every war strategy. You knew everything that was happening. You know what the king's heartbeat was, what his desire was? Do you realize that you've been invited to the throne room of the king? But you can't get away from your Xbox and your PS4 and your Instagram and your Facebook long enough long enough to get into the throne room of God. You can't get away from what you want long enough to hear what He wants. And every day that you go without prayer, you've handed the devil that day. Somebody's walked into eternity that day. I'm going to teach this and preach it till it breaks. But God has a tremendous harvest for this district. And you're a key element in what He's going to do in this end time. But we are distracted by devices. We are distracted by Hollywood. We are distracted by video games. I'm not against video games. I'm not against every movie. But I'm going to tell you right now. When it consumes our time. That we have no time for the king. There's something wrong in our world. There's something wrong. I stood in a room like this many years ago. And they asked, they asked everybody to raise their hand that had won a soul to the Lord. And I was ashamed. Because I saw these young teenagers raising their hand. And I'm a pre-K and I hadn't done it yet. But I got on my knees that day. And I said, I'm not going into heaven without taking somebody with me. I'm leaving this meeting. I'm leaving this conference to go win a soul to the Lord. I'm glad to tell you that I went back to that meeting a couple years later and I was able to raise my hand because I had led some teenagers from my school to the Lord. And I'm going to tell you right now, I believe there's some people in this room that said, I don't want to go into heaven and, and, and not take somebody with me. Am I preaching to anybody right now that would say, oh God, let me make a difference. Let me, let me make a difference. I don't know how long I've gone. I've just tried to be led of the Lord. But to be the king, king's cupbearer. And he said, King, he said, King, I can't help it today. I can't control my countenance today. Because it's not about me today, it's about the kingdom. My people are lost. And I'm asking you, would you give me favor to go and lead my people and build the kingdom back and make it what it was? And the kingdom said, Why, sure. The king said, Why, sure, I will. You know why he entrusted him with this purpose and this destiny? Because for years, he never wanted anything from the king except just what the king wanted. He, he wasn't petitioning the king for anything. He just, what do you want, king? What do you want, king? What do you want? I'll do whatever you want. I'll risk my life day after day to make sure that your kingdom lives. Then all of a sudden, at some point, a burden dropped in him for his destiny and his purpose. Your pastor shouldn't have to preach without you behind him. Come on. If he calls revival and it's a sports night somewhere, you ought to be at revival instead of the sports event. Are you hearing me? You shouldn't walk into that sanctuary sleepy and weary. Come on, you got to go to that church this coming Sunday and be the first one with the amen. Come on, you're not too young. I've come to tell you, you're not too young. You're not, you're not too young. Lift your hands to the Lord. They play softly. I want you to reach out to God right now. Oh, God. Oh, God. 
<laughs> oh God. I don't want, I don't want them to be lost. I don't want my children, my family, my neighbors. Come on, over this room, I want you to, I want you to reach out to God. Come on, all over this room, I want you to reach out to God. When's the last time you were alone with the king and you could hear him talking about his kingdom and what he's doing in your community, what he wants to do? When's the last time you wept over a soul? You wept over the lost. the last time I want us to come and pray all over this room we need to repent we need to repent for not focusing on the king all over the room I want you to come I want you to come the Lord's moving we got to get our heart in the direction of the king come on don't, don't stop praying I want you to pray all the way to the altar the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. Come on, all over this altar. Come on, all over this room. I want you to come. Come on, press as close as you can. The cupbearer. I've got to become concerned about what the king's concerned about. Come on. Come on, I want you to come as close as you can. Come on, there's missionaries in this room, but you haven't heard it yet because you haven't been near the king. Come on, there's youth pastors in this room, but you haven't heard it yet because you haven't been near the king. God could trust Nehemiah because he had a relationship of sacrifice with the king. Come on, all over this room, there's a destiny. How are you going to win people in other countries if you can't win people in your own town? There's a call of God. I'm making a covenant to be with the king. Nehemiah for my community I want everybody in this room I want you reaching out to God and say Lord I don't want somebody to be lost because I haven't been alone with you against apathy and mediocrity in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of apathy in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of mediocrity in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of inadequacy in the name of Jesus. Come on, you've got an invitation to be alone with the king to hear what his business is. 
about my father's business. Oh God, I bind the spirit. I bind the spirit of apathy. In Jesus' name. Anybody care? Does anybody care about a lost world? Does anybody care about a Kim who's praying at night? Does anybody care? Is anybody here? Does anybody care? Does anybody care about a lost world? be heard to the king right now come on lift your voice everybody in this altar Lord I want to make a difference Of your prayer in the throne room of the king. Somebody say this, praying in the spirit. You just need to every day block a time and get along with God and learn how to pray. You're not going to start, you're not going to get it done until you start doing it. You got to have self-denial. Everybody say fasting. That's part of denying yourself to be in the presence of the king. Skipping some meals, going 24 hours without food. Everybody say fasting and prayer. I was praying the other day, praying for our church and our community. All of a sudden, in prayer, a random name came to me. And I started praying, oh, God, touch her. You see what she's going through in loneliness. Man, I began to pray in the spirit for her. wasn't speaking in tongues. I was praying just as God would deal with me to pray. That night, she was at church. And I went to her and I said, while I was in my prayer today, you came to my mind very, very strong. I began to call on your name in prayer. She said, was it between 1 and 2 o'clock? I said, sure was. She said, I was sitting at my desk at work, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost came on me. She said, it moved me so mightily. I had to get up from my desk and step into another room and begin to cry because God began to touch me at that time, and I didn't understand why. There's power in prayer. Now, I'm going to tell you what I feel. I understand the time. I've asked permission to tell you a story. You have time for a story? I, I, I never want to take advantage of time, but I just feel like you need to know where we are. The Lord is about to come. And there is a bunch of prayers of some grandmothers. There's some prayers of people that they prayed, like my grandma prayed last night, I told you. And the scripture tells us that the Lord added to the church daily. How did he do that? How did he do that? He used people to add them. No one's been saved that the Lord didn't add. But he added them through a witness. And uh, just bear with me a moment. I, uh, Brother, Brother Nichols, a couple years ago, not even two years ago, I was preaching a meeting in Texas and was getting ready to fly to Southern California to preach a meeting. 
Got on the plane. I flew to Salt Lake City, Utah for a layover. Got on the plane there to go to Southern California to preach. In uh, Salt Lake City, I was getting ready to get on the plane and I was hungry. And, uh, you know, you get too hungry, you get hangry. You know what I'm talking about? That's angry hungry. And I don't know about you if you've ever flown, but sometimes you got to run from one place to the other. You get on the plane and you starve and get, get any lunch. The plane was late and you get on the plane and somebody's got this food right next to you. I mean, you're talking about torture. I thought I had a little, I had a little time, so I got me a personal pan pizza to take on the plane with me. I, I was standing in, uh, in the gate and this lady walks up to me and she says, she says, I hope I get to sit beside you on the plane. She can smell that pizza, you know. And uh, I said, well, I'll share. Well, if you know about flying, the seats are prearranged. And I got on the plane, went and sat on my seat. And a little bit later, here she came. There's probably 200 seats on the plane. Here she came. Out of all those seats, guess where she sat? That's not an accident. She sat right there. <laughs> I chuckled. I said, I'll share. I told you I'd share. She said, I was just teasing. I was just teasing. Look up a little bit later, the plane's filling up. Here comes a guy with the ball cap on. Here he comes down the aisle. And he said, excuse me, may I, may I get in the seat there? And I got out so he'd get in his seat and he sits down. When he sits by the window, he looks over at me. He said, I sat in this same seat beside you on the, on the last flight. From Texas, to all the places he could go out of Salt Lake City, all the planes he could be going on. And he had to sit in that seat because somebody had gotten in his seat. I said, that's right, you were, that's right. I was half dead asleep, you know what I'm saying. I didn't recognize even the world existed, I think, on the last flight. But I said, that's right, you were, yeah. Sitting there, and all of a sudden, the plane takes off, we're up in the air. I think I'd already eaten my pizza, amen. And, and, and he gets his Bible out and starts reading it. And the lady in between us, she says, oh my goodness. I got a Bible reader on this side of me, and I got a preacher on this side of me. <laughs> and I thought, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> he said, you're a preacher? I said, yeah, I'm a preacher. Watch, watch what he says. He said, I'm so hungry for God. He said, I gave my life to the Lord three months ago. He said, I'm so hungry for God. He said, you're a preacher. Why was Jesus baptized? And I told him. He was an example. He didn't baptize for sin because he had sin, but as our example to be baptized. And I started telling, telling miracles. I'd seen, uh, I'd seen 16 miracles in our local church. I'm talking about liver disease healed, heart valves fixed, kidney disease failure turned around. I'm talking about tumors disappearing. Miracle after miracle I'd seen. As a matter of fact, last year I've seen, I saw five blinded eyes open last year. It's our day. And I started telling them these healing stories. Is everybody okay for a minute? I started telling them about these miracles on the plane, some 30, some thousand feet in the air. And when I start talking about Jesus, she starts crying. <laughs> She's wiping her tear. I don't know why I'm crying. Oh, she was embarrassed because you can't be pretty and cry at the same time, I guess. Why am I crying? Oh, why am I crying? I said, because when Jesus squeezes your heart, juice comes out your eyes. She thought that was cute. <clears throat> and God was moving. And she said, you know, the person flying with me got sick and couldn't come. And she said, I was raised Mormon. And she said, I know that's not the right way. And she said, I looked up into the sky before I got on the plane and said, if you're real, if you're real, then show me the way. It's no accident she smelt pizza. It's no accident that her seat was assigned beside me. And it's no accident that the guy that's sitting in the window beside me, somebody got his seat so he had to sit beside me again because I was too sleepy on the first flight doing anything about it. Are you hearing me? It's no accident. And this is what I said. I said, I am preaching a meeting one mile from the airport tonight. I want you to come. They're crying. We're praying together on the plane, not loud and boastful, just praying. And, and she said, I can't. I've got a meeting tonight. And Kirk said, I'll be there. I'm glad to tell you he came to the camp meeting that night. And I looked back after I was preaching, had his hands raised, and God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 
story even gets better. He calls me the next day and he said, man, I've been studying this tongues thing. And uh, he said, listen, preacher, man, that tongues thing's in the Bible. I said, I know, it's in there. Watch what happens. He said, I'm going to be off work next week. I try to line him up with the church in Texas. He lived in Texas. Flies on the flight and gets the Holy Ghost in, in California. He said, I'll be off all next week. I'm excited about having some time off in this. He calls me the next Thursday. Listen, listen. He calls me the next Thursday. And he said, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, I'm in the parking lot of your church in Ohio. I said, what? He said, it's a, it's a long story. I was supposed to be off, but the guy got sick and he travels all over the country doing this stuff and training. And he said, my boss called me and said, I had to go to Ohio this week. He's from Texas. He gets the Holy Ghost in Southern California. And he's standing in the parking lot of my church. Watch. I said, well, I think I can come. <laughs> I'm just teasing. You know I'm going to be there. I go there, and this is what he says. He says, Aaron, he said, listen, I sort of do think that God's probably put us together. <laughs> what do you think? He said, I know God's going to tell you to tell me something before you do. He said, why is it that my boy at the table the other night when we were talking about God, he said, you know, I think God and Jesus are the same one. He said, I don't understand. I thought there were three. What does that mean? I was ex able to explain to him. Anyhow, long story short, he said, I said, have you ever, do you know anybody in your family that like apostolic or anything? He said, I don't know. I really don't. He said, I'm just sort of scared to tell people that I'm tongue tar. You got to ease that kind of stuff in on your family, you know. That's what he said. Yeah. I said, I want you to go ask. Man, I feel a witness of the Spirit right now. I really do. I feel like something's going to happen. Faith is going to be inspired, and I want you to receive it. Are you ready to receive something of the Lord? Watch what happens. I told him, I said, well, when you feel like it, ask your family or your dad or whoever. Ask them about maybe your grandmother or whatever and see what they were like. And he said, he called me not too long after. And he said, well, I called, talked to my dad. And he said, you know, I was sort of nervous. He said, but I said, Dad, I just want to tell you. He said, I, I, got, I went to California and I, I spoke in tongues. His dad said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He said, Dad, I just want to know, do we have any family members that did anything like that? He said, well, son, your grandma was so good at it that other people could talk in tongues in church and she could tell them, everybody else, what they said. <laughs> he said, I said, well, what church was she a part of? He said, she was a member of the United Pentecostal Church in Shreveport, Louisiana. You think it's an accident that his seat gets put beside mine? Somebody gets in a seat on the other flight and puts it beside mine. No, I'm going to tell you what was happening. God was ordering some steps. I want everybody to take your left hand and put it like this. And I want everybody to take your right hand and put it like this. I want you to do this, like this. It's called spiritual alignment. Everybody say spiritual alignment. It's where God takes the hungry and he puts them in the path of the believer. It's where God takes the hungry and puts them into the path of the believer. And if you will get near the king, God's going to give you the burden and is going to give you spiritual alignment to win a soul this year. If you believe that, I want you to say amen. amen. Lift your hands. Open your spirit. By the authority of the word of God and the power of the name of Jesus, I lose faith into every believer. faith into every believer to win their city to believe they can win their community to be soul winners and an apostolic witness to this generation in the name of Jesus I lose a boldness in Jesus name I lose an authority in the name of Jesus that they would walk in confidence and praise him come on God's going to multiply you he's going to make you fruitful just another